Good morning, church, and happy Sunday. My name is Pastor Zach. I'm one of the youth pastors here at New Hope, and I'm honored to share with you a message this morning. This morning's message was supposed to be a message titled, Jesus, the Good Shepherd. And I preached it, and I recorded it earlier, and it was edited, and I was excited for it, and I felt confident about it. And it was a comfortable message for me to preach. Uh, But how many know that sometimes being comfortable, God calls us to be a little more uncomfortable? Um, And I don't know about you, but as I watched uh, the video of George Floyd, and ever since then, I became pretty uncomfortable. I was I was in a place of being uncomfortable, and I'm I'm not racist, and uh, I've never had thoughts like that. But as I watched that. I, and as I've processed it, I'll admit that I have been a, a person who has not stepped up and called out things when they have happened before. And this morning, uh, it's a little uncomfortable and it's a little scary and intimidating preaching a message like this, but I believe that God's called me to speak this message. On Thursday night, I was mowing and I felt God say, you need to change it up. And I told my wife, hey, I'm feeling like God's telling me that. So we prayed. And as we prayed, I said, God, if, if this is what you're calling me to do, uh, I need you to wake me up. And how many know that God likes to wake us up? And at 4.30 in the morning, there was a rainstorm happening, and I forgot I left something outside. I had to go outside. And in the middle of standing out in a thunderstorm, I was reminded, you told me to wake you up. So God laid this message on my heart. I hope it challenges you. I hope it encourages you. And I hope that we can see heaven grow from this. But first, let's pray. Jesus, God, I I thank you that you've laid a message on my heart for for new hope, for for whoever's listening to this message this morning. God, I pray that you would just speak through me. I pray that you would take things out of my notes that need to come out and you would put things into my notes that need to be there. I pray you'd open up hearts and ears to hear what you have to say to people through me this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Church, I'm calling us to a standard that it's time that we end racism. And this is an issue that we can no longer be silent about. And here's why, it's because we have the answer. You have the answer. There's no politician, there's no athlete, there's no billionaire, there's no law passed that will ever bring an answer, but we can. We have have the answer to solve this issue, and you know what that answer is? It's just Jesus. The answer, it's just, it's so simple. The answer is Jesus, and if other people don't have this answer, there will always be a problem. And it is our responsibility as Christians to love one another, to share the answer, and to do as Jesus would do, and to share that answer, that the answer is just Jesus. So this morning's message is titled, It's Just Jesus. And I don't want you to think that because I'm talking about this issue today that I think we have racist people in our church. That's not it at all. I believe that we are a church who really try our best to love and to care about every single person. But we, we have to recognize that this is an issue in our society today. And my prayer is that as, as we walk through this together this morning, that we can learn together and we can work to end this problem. Maybe for you personally, uh, it's, it's a prejudice that you might have against someone. Maybe it's a, a thing of color, maybe it's gender, economics, the clothes someone wears, the vehicle they drive, where they're from, maybe it's their age, uh, maybe it's their political party. Whatever it may be, it's time that we set those things aside, we look past those things, and we view people how Jesus would view them, and we show them love. So this morning, I want you to see this verse first in Mark chapter 12, and it says this, One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. He's saying it this. It all boils down to this. Love God and love your neighbor. Love God and love people. And what you'll see is that if you truly have a love for God, loving people comes easy. If you truly love God, loving people comes easy. And if you truly love God and you truly love people, then all of our actions and our attitudes will line up with God's commands and his instructions. Loving God and loving people. Notice this. He doesn't say, love your white neighbor. Love your rich neighbor. Love your healthy neighbor. Love your cool neighbor. He's saying, love your neighbor. Love whoever is around you. You might be saying, well, Pastor Zach, my neighbor is crazy. This person that that I work with, they are very annoying. They're very different. They do this. It's it's weird. God's saying, I don't care about that. Love your neighbor. Show them love. Did you know that Christianity is the most inclusive religion in the whole world? 
I don't know about what your Bible says, but my version of John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world. Not for God so loved America, not for God so loved white people, for God so loved the world. This is the most inclusive religion. Any other religion you can look at, and that you've got to be born into it. You've got to do a certain thing, but Christianity, following Jesus, is saying, whosoever believes is going to heaven. And in Revelation 7, 9, we see a picture of what heaven looks like. It says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Guess what? We're going to be united together, every tribe, every nation, every race, whether it's here on earth or in heaven. And if you are really believing the Bible, then we're going to do whatever we can to make it happen here on earth. Because we see it in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in in heaven, every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, our daily prayer should be make it on earth as it is in heaven. I want to ask you this question this morning. Are you living your life to see the picture of heaven on earth? Are you starting to get the idea of all of this? There's a lot that the Bible has to say about this topic. Why? Because I think God knew that we would struggle with this issue. I think he knew that things like this would come up, that, that we would view people the way that we should not view them. I want to show you in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 14, it says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. We see that racism has been a part of America from the beginning. And even right now, we are not super far removed from it. I mean, you have the Jim Crow era of segregation. And guess what? That's exactly what Satan wants. That's exactly what Satan wants. He wants a divided world. Satan wants a divided nation. He wants a divided church, a divided family. Satan's trying to divide us, and that's what he's done with the world. But Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our minds, our way of thinking, they were messed up from the beginning. Why? Because we were born into a fallen world. But Christ's love, it says, should compel us. That we will become a new creation, that we have a new way of thinking, a new way of seeing people. The old life is gone. And lots of times we like to think like, oh, the old is gone. My pain is gone. My hurt is gone. My fear is gone. But this is saying the old life is gone. This includes how you view people, how you talk about people, how you stereotype people. The old way is gone. And once you become a believer, a follower of Jesus, the old response is no longer acceptable. Continue reading verse 18, it says, And all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ, and God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. How are you going to tell someone about Jesus if you won't even talk to them? Verse 19, For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's skin, I mean sin, against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Did you catch that? God is going to do that through you. He's saying, I'm going to send you to workplaces, to neighborhoods with racist people. And I'm going to use you, follower of Jesus, to bring reconciliation. I need you to be my representative. You as a Christian, a follower of Jesus, you have a responsibility to represent Christ everywhere you go everywhere you go. And maybe you're saying, well, I don't know how I'm going to do that. My boss is just always going to be that way. That person is just always going to say those jokes. It's time we step up and we call those jokes out when they happen. That we no longer just sit there and listen and laugh along or don't say anything. We got to call it out. We cannot be silent. But remember, change does not happen from hate or from mean. You have to speak with truth and love. Maybe you're saying, I don't know how I'm going to bring it up to that person, to my cousin, to my spouse, to that neighbor, to that colleague. It's simple. Here's how we, how we solve the problem. It's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. Because we see that the moment that true heart change happens and you give your life over to Jesus, you see the world how he sees the world. 
here at New Hope, there are over 20 nations represented in our church, and they are all loved by God. They are all called by God. They're all important to God. They are all made in the image of God. And when we see people how Jesus sees people, that every person from every nation, every tribe is loved, called, made in the image of, it changes everything. And it's our responsibility as Christians to make people see that. We can't rely on politicians or new law. Why? Because righteousness is a matter of the heart. Only Jesus can change the heart. We, I, I, I see how some of this can be confusing because social media posts, those can be okay. And for sure there's a time that protests are necessary. But understand that none of these things, although they can be good and although they can be used as tools, none of these things can truly change someone's heart. They aren't the answer. The answer is simply this. It's just Jesus. It's you being a Christ ambassador and loving God and loving people on earth as it is in heaven. What's fitting is that we have been in this series here at New Hope uh, for a little while now called the Red Letter Series, looking at what did Jesus say and, and how did he live his life. And like I said, I had a message prepared for today called the Good Shepherd, but God had other plans. But what's fitting is that we see that Jesus actually had a lot to say, and we see how he lived his life was agreeing with what we're talking about today. So this is, this is so fitting for this red letter series, because I believe that if Jesus were in flesh today, he would have been in the middle of all of this. He would have intervened in that moment with George Floyd. He would have intervened in a moment of riots. And you know what? Just like today, I think if that happened in the Bible, the Pharisees would have looked at him and they would have criticized him whether he was with this group or that group. He he would have been criticized for either side. Specifically today, I want us to look at John chapter 4, a story that you're probably familiar with. If you've been coming to church for a while, this is one that you're probably familiar with. It's a story of the woman at the well. And maybe you say, I've heard it all before. I know all this. But maybe there's something that you didn't know as you've read this before. Jesus, in one chapter, reverses 800 years of racial division. In one conversation, 800 years reversed. 800 years reversed of black versus white, of your side of town versus my side of town. We see he reverses 800 years of of men versus women. 800 years of racial division erased in one conversation. So in John 4, that's where we'll be. And we see at the beginning of this chapter, we see Jesus is going around and he's healing people and he's baptizing people. And the Pharisees, they get mad at him. And Jesus is like, hey, you know what? We're not going to deal with this. How about we go uh, go to Galilee? Let's go somewhere else. So they go from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north. But there's this place in the middle called Samaria. And the Jews, if you don't know much about this, but the Jews and the Samaritans did not really get along. They they were from the same place, but they had very different cultures. They, they, They did not like each other. The Jews actually viewed the Samaritans as dogs. Does that sound like a little bit of American history to us? But starting in John chapter 4, looking at verse 4, it says this, He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at this time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Stop right there. I want to show you a couple things from this passage. We see one that Jesus, he stops at this well. He's tired. He's thirsty. He's hungry. He's exhausted. And as soon as this woman comes up, he's ready for a conversation to begin. Let that remind us, be a good reminder to us that we need to be ready to have a conversation in any moment. That there's no excuse that I'm tired, I'm thirsty, I'm hangry. We need to be ready to have that conversation in a moment. But we see that Jesus is hungry, so the disciples go to get some food. So now the disciples are gone, we see that there's two people in the story. We see that there's this Samaritan woman who's coming, and the other person is just Jesus. Also take note where he stops. He stops at this well. Whose well is that? This is Jacob's well. You see, if you don't know much about this, the Samaritans would have followed the Pentateuch, which was the first five books of the Bible, and the Jews also followed this book. So if you look at that, Jacob was a key character in this. So both groups would have had a reason to want to go to Jacob's well. Are you seeing what Jesus is doing here? Before he starts this conversation with this woman, he finds a common ground to meet with her. He he finds a a moment that he can meet with her that's common, not a moment of tension, but a a common ground that they both agreed on something. If you want to break down barriers between you and someone of a different ethnicity, you and someone of a different color, 
you need to find common ground. Talk about their kids. Talk about how's work going. Hey, where did you go to school? Hey, where did you grow up? You see them wearing a certain uh, sports team shirt. Ask them about that team. Find a common ground. Verse 9. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Notice that in this moment, there was not only the, the racial or the prejudice of her being a Samaritan, but it brings up, uh, it points out this, that not only was she a Samaritan, but she was a woman. In the secular Jewish culture, they would have had women keep their place. They would have said, hey, you stay over here. Hey, you don't talk unless we ask you to talk. So she was surprised that Jesus would come up to her as a Samaritan woman and that he would talk to her. You see, Jesus, when he came, he brought equality to men and women. And Paul said that the kingdom of God, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female. In other words, he's saying everyone is equal in God's eyes. Yes, they are different. And I'm thankful that there are differences, but everyone is equal in God's eyes. She says, you are a Jew. Did you notice that? That she called him out. You are a Jew. And notice that Jesus, he never even told her that that's what he was. This tells me that she recognized there's a difference between me and you. No different than you looking at me right now and you noticing, yeah, you are white. There's no denial that I am white. Notice that as he, this Jew, goes into the Samaritan village, he doesn't have to pretend to be someone he wasn't to have this conversation. He doesn't have to try to look like a Samaritan to have this conversation. He was exactly who he was. He, he, he didn't try to pretend. In order to reach people of a different culture, you don't have to pretend to be just like them. You don't have to pretend. If you don't like country music, you don't have to pretend to like country. If you don't like rap music, you don't have to pretend to like that. That's fine. You don't need things of earth, of this earth, to reach people for Jesus. What do you need? It's just Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. Things of this earth can be used as tools. And I, I am all for using whatever tools we can that follow along with what the Bible says to reach people for Jesus. But all we need to reach someone, it's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. Do you know that it's okay to be uncomfortable? Being a Christian can be uncomfortable. Why? Because it goes against the norm. Giving extra to missions is uncomfortable. Why? Because it goes against the norm of what the world does. Putting an end to racism with using the only answer, it's just Jesus, might be uncomfortable. Why? Because that's going against the norm. And that might mean you being uncomfortable, you stepping out, you going out to eat with someone of a different uh, ethnicity to a place that you have never been. Talking about something that you don't know everything about, that can be uncomfortable. But I want to emphasize to you today, listen to them, ask questions, and, and really just ask to understand, really to know that this person, get to know them. It's uncomfortable, but I promise you it will be worth it. It's worth making a new friend. It's worth putting an end to racism. It's worth it if one more person can make it to heaven. It's worth being uncomfortable. You want to know what first surprised this woman in this story is that Jesus would do something that was very uncomfortable. He, put, he asked her for a drink and he did not have a cup. He put his Jewish lips on her Samaritan cup. You see that Jesus was willing to identify with her. And if a person is hurting, if a community is hurting, you don't have to know everything they are going through. Just begin to ask questions. Just begin to, to tell them, hey, I don't know what all you're going through, but I'm here for you. Empathize with their experience. Listen to their pains. Don't just ask questions to ask questions, but listen to the answer. And don't just try as, you, as we ask questions. Don't just try to fix the problem. But do as Jesus would do and love them through the situation. And as you connect and as you identify with people, whether they are the same color as you or a different color of you, you will see that it opens up the door to talk about Jesus. Hear me, church. You can't engage someone's problems until you engage them personally. You cannot offer up the solution of Jesus until you engage this person personally. Continue reading in verse 10. It says, Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift of God, that he has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestors Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. 
Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Jesus says, go and get your husband. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. And in verse 19, she says, sir, you must be a prophet. Do you see what just happens here? Jesus, he first interacts with her personally, and that granted him access to her problems. That granted him access to give her the answer. When we engage people personally, when we meet them on a personal level, when we interact with them, when we show them that we care, when they know that we care, then you can present the answer. It's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. Jesus gains access to her whole life. They went from talking about water to her lifestyle in a moment. Jump down to verse 25, it says, The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman. Remember, Jesus was breaking all sorts of barriers as this happened. But none of them had the nerve to ask, What do you want with her? Why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. So notice this. The disciples, a group of people, went into the city. Going there, they had no intention of reconciliation with the Samaritans. They had no intentions of being Christ's ambassadors. They had no intention of giving the answer that it's just Jesus. And because they had no intention, they had no result. But Jesus, it's, it's just Jesus. One man by himself sat outside the village at a strategic spot and had one positive conversation that changed this woman so much that she went back into the city and told everyone what had just happened and they came to Jesus. Hear me church, the answer is just Jesus. It's just Jesus. And you might be sitting there and you might be waiting for a group of people like the disciples to go into a city with you to offer up the answer. You might be waiting like, hey, who else is going to go do this with me? But quit waiting for other people to do it. Jesus is saying, all you need is the answer. All you need is to know that it's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. Verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. They're like, Hold up a second. Wait a minute. Did someone bring this guy some Chick-fil-A? Because we don't know anything about that yet. Verse 33. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up, look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. Church, do you understand that everything that is going on right now in our country is a seed that has been planted? It's a seed that has been planted. And as a church, we could just wait four months for for it to come up when all this calms down. But God woke me up at 4.30 a.m. on a Friday morning to say, Zach, it's ripe. Zach, the the fields are ready for harvest. And if you would just show my love, if you would just say my name, if you would just do what I would do and love people. Church, I'm asking you this morning, are you ready to see an end to injustice? Are you ready to see an end to racism? Because you've got the answer. Are you going to share the answer or are you going to hold it to yourself? It's just Jesus. Are you ready to see people come to know Jesus? Are you ready to see the hurt and the pain disappear? Let's offer up the answer, it's just Jesus. And as you sit at home this morning, maybe it's in your living room, maybe it's in your kitchen, maybe you're driving to work, maybe you're sitting at work, wherever you may be, I wanna ask you this question. Are you ready to respond to Jesus? And maybe as you sit there, you recognize that you have not let Jesus into your heart. You, you've gone far from him, and this morning you are ready to accept Jesus as Lord of your life. You're ready to accept the answer that it's just Jesus, and you're ready to give your life over to him, surrendering your will over to his will, giving him full control of your life. If that's you, and you wanna to respond to that, I wanna just ask you to do something. This might be a little uncomfortable, might be a little different, but wherever you're at, I just want you to say, that's me. That's me, God. Or raise your hand to saying, God, that's me. This is just between you and God. This is just an outward expression of an inward decision that you're making. 
And as you're making that decision, let me tell you, this is the greatest decision that you could ever make. And we are so excited that you are making this decision. We wanna celebrate with you. And if that's you and you're responding to Jesus today, I, I encourage you to text HOPE, H-O-P-E, to 515-800-2014. We wanna connect with you and we wanna give you materials for what's next in your walk with Jesus. The other group I wanna address this morning is this, is as you're sitting there this morning, wherever it may be, maybe it's a, a day from now, maybe it's two days from now, and you're saying, I'm ready to make that commitment to spread love, to, to, to spread the answer that it's just Jesus. I'm ready to make a commitment that I'm gonna do whatever I can to put an end to racism. Be ready because this might be uncomfortable. It's gonna take you stepping out. It's gonna take you going out of your, your comfort zone, stepping out of those boundaries that you've created. But isn't it worth it if it's one more person coming to heaven? But if that's you, wherever you're at, I want you just to raise your hand and say, God, that's me, I, I'm ready to step up. I'm ready to step out. And I want to say, thank you for making that decision. And God, I promise you, is gonna walk you through that. You might be saying, well, how am I gonna do that? Well, last Sunday we talked about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit gives us the power to do this. So let's rely on him. I wanna pray for you and, and just say once again, if you respond to one of those things, that is the best decision that you can make. And we are so excited and so proud of you. Jesus, I thank you for every person listening this morning. I thank you for those who responded accepting you as Lord of their life. God, I pray that you would just begin to reveal things to them right now as they are listening, of things that they need to get rid of in their life, of things that they need to get stop doing that they've been doing for so long. And I pray that they would know that they are loved by you, that, that you care for them, that you have uh, hope and a future for them, God. I thank you that they made that decision today and that they will spend eternity in heaven with you as they follow you. God, I pray for those who responded today saying, I'm ready to put an end to this. I'm ready to start spreading the answer. I'm ready to start showing the love of Jesus wherever I go. I pray you give them wisdom. I pray you give those people boldness to step up in conversations. I pray that, that we would seek after you every morning, noon, and evening, all throughout the day to look for what, who are you calling us to talk to? Who are you wanting us to reach out to? And that we would step out of our, our normal comfort zones and that we would reach people who, who need to hear your name. We love you and we thank you. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, we are so glad that you've joined us for service this morning. We wanna invite you to come back at 6 p.m. We have our senior rec service. It's been a crazy year for our seniors to, to end this year and we wanna celebrate them and support them all that we can. If you're watching on YouTube or if you're not watching on YouTube, go to our YouTube channel, subscribe. If, if you like videos like this, if you like a sermon like this, if you're encouraged and challenged, there's more like this on our YouTube channel. We love you. Have a great Sunday.